What's going on, guys? This is Larry Brown. Thank you for joining us for another edition of the Tenacity Strength Fit for Duty podcast. My co-host, Vaughn Etienne, is uh, on vacation, taking a mental break, uh, rescuing, the, rescuing the streets of Gotham City from those who uh, dare to intrude. Uh, but today I have a very special guest. I've been trying to nail this guest for about a week and a half, two weeks now. Um, Mr. I'm I'm probably gonna butcher your last name, Damian Pizzuzzi. <laughs> uh, Pizzuzzi, good. Pizzuzzi, it, it was close. Though. Pizzuzzi. Yeah, yeah. Pizzuzzi. Okay, thank you, thank you. I don't know why why I put an R in your name. I'm totally unsure <laughs> of that. Uh, but a, a little background on me and uh, Damian's history: we've actually followed each other on Twitter and Instagram for a number of years now. Originally on Twitter. Uh, back when I was in that sphere, back when we were in the sphere of powerlifting, uh, heavy strength training, um, we've since transitioned uh, from that stage in our uh, in our weightlifting uh, journey, if you want to call it. Uh, but the one thing that I have always been impressed with about Damien is his uh, athletic ability, and it is athletic ability to be able to squat damn near every day. Uh, he has an interesting story, interesting background. So, Damien, please, thank you, first of all, for joining us. I know it's early. But first of all, uh, give us a little bit of background info. Where are you from? Uh, how'd you get there? And, you know, what do you do for a living? No, hey, thank you. I really appreciate you uh, having me on. And I'm glad we could finally uh, nail down the time that works for both of us. But, uh, yeah, um, so I'm originally from western Pennsylvania, about 60 miles 45, 60 miles north of Pittsburgh. So diehard Pittsburgh Steelers, Pittsburgh Penguins fan. Um, my weightlifting journey was kind of interesting. Um, I got started in seventh grade. Um, our local school, junior high and high school announced that we were having a lift-a-thon at the end of the year. And actually my mom was really big into fitness. And uh, I went to her and I told her I wanted to uh, compete in the school lift-a-thon. And she wrote up a a five-day training program it was a basic you know bodybuilding type split um, but I came home faithfully every day after school and we'll go up and use our universal machine and never missed a workout and uh, ended up winning our left us on as a seventh grader against the ninth graders so that's kind of the start of my journey and that's where I really fell in love with it and pretty much trained like a bodybuilder um, throughout uh, most of my high school journey and then my senior year of high school is when I did my first powerlifting meet. It was a local AAU meet. And uh, I ended up qualifying for the Junior Olympics down in New Orleans. Went down there and competed, had a very successful meet, uh, and then did the whole powerlifting thing for a while. Um, squat every day and stuff. And then my journey took me to Rapid City, South Dakota in 2017. And then just earlier this year, March of 2021, I moved out here to Bozeman, Montana, and I work as a performance coach at Prime Performance and Physio. It's pretty much a dream job for me. Um, I love the people that I work with, all the people that I work for, and uh, I love living in Montana, man. It's just, it's absolutely incredible out here. Now, is your, your education, your formal education, is, is it in exercise science, physiology, or any type of exercise science related field? It is not. So I actually had two, I did two personal training certifications and then I did um, the corrective exercise specialist certification from NASM. But to be honest with you, most of my background and knowledge of training came through just reading material from a plethora of people. But uh, some of my biggest influences are Charlie Francis, um, Ivan Abijev, the great Bulgarian weightlifting coach, David Woodhouse, who is a weightlifting coach over in, I believe it's Britain. And then recently, I've really gotten big into the ATG stuff, um, the knees over toes guy, Ben Patrick, who's just been absolutely fantastic in uh, communicating and, and helping me out. So uh, those are pretty much the four pillars um, that I kind of pull from in my training. So would you consider yourself more of a, uh, a high volume type of guy? No, definitely. I'm, I'm definitely a high intensity, low volume type of guy. Um, I don't do very well with volume. I never really have. I respond best to higher intensities, lower volume. And even if I'm not training, say the squat at a high frequency, like right now I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm training maybe once or twice a week. It's still very high intensity, you know, working up to a, 
a top single and it maybe you know a back off double or two at 90 percent. so i've never volumes always tended to run me into the ground and you know in my experience i'm a very fast twitch dominant athlete um and so to me in my experience just in training people i think fast twitch dominant athletes tend to respond better to higher intensity work whereas your slower twitch dominant athletes tend to respond better to higher volume now you're you're essentially self-taught you took your personal training certifications uh you've experimented on yourself in the gym transferred that to your clients uh what are some of the what are some of the texts that you've had uh, some of the books that you've you've drawn from or that you recommend to people because you bring up uh you know being fast twitch dominant but a lot of people don't uh, understand if you're training for athleticism, if you're training for strength and power, some of those uh, fibers need to be trained and it's not found through traditional, uh, what we consider powerlifting training. So where do you draw your, where did you draw your information from? Yeah, so uh, big time, the, the, the power and, and strength and speed stuff, I would, training for speed, the Charlie Francis training system, um, I purchased that one many years ago, and that was a fantastic uh, resource for me. I still refer to it every now and then. Um, he also had an e-book, I shouldn't say an e-book, but an e-video um, called GPP Essentials, which was really good, well worth it. Um, Speed Trap, um, which is a great book about his overall philosophy, um, how he trained Ben Johnson. And then of course, it also goes into uh, the 1988 scandal um, between you know Ben Johnson and, and Carl Lewis and stuff, but that also kind of kind of details, you know, Charlie's philosophy. Um, and like the Bulgarian stuff, you know, there's really no actual like book on it. It's just, there's a couple of different, uh, really good articles that I came across. Um, and I would say that's pretty much it. Like most of my textual resource comes from Charlie Francis. I just bought something of his last night called training for power and strength and speed. And it is a really, really good read. It's like an $8 ebook and stuff that is well worth well worth the purchase. So most of my influence as far as training for speed and explosiveness and power um, definitely comes from Charlie Francis. Now, for those that are the uninitiated or, you know, haven't dived into this type of material, uh, Charlie Francis, Francis is a famous uh, strength conditioning coach whose uh, specialty was track and field. As you just heard Damian mention, uh, he coached Ben Johnson, uh, Ben Johnson of Canada, Carl Lewis uh, of the USA went head to head in the 1988 Olympics. Um, fortunately, for those that are not old enough to know, uh, Ben Johnson won that race but lost the medal due to uh, performance enhancing testing positive, quote unquote, uh, for performance enhancing drugs. But essentially, he dusted Carl Lewis uh, with using, I guess, Winstroll, which I never understood as a performance enhancer for track, always for bodybuilding, but that's besides the point. Um, how do you sequence your training between weights and uh, lifting still heavy like you do right now? Um, is it high, low? H how are you sequencing that right now? Yeah, it's, 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 it tends to be, if I have more time, I like to do the traditional Charlie Francis high-low model where it's the explosive medicine ball work, the jumps and the weight training on one day, and then like the recovery stuff, the tempo work and the low-intensity abdominal work on the next day. Um, right now, I have a very, very busy schedule. Um, just so, you know, I work with a number of people at Prime. And so in an effort to try to have the most efficient template and training structure possible, my current template is... I train six days a week. Day one is med ball and jumps. Day two is my weight. Day three is that low intensity tempo. And then I just repeat um, that same three day structure the next three days and then I take a day off. And so I found by not combining the med ball and the jumps and the weights, I'm able to do each session in maybe like 45 to 60 minutes. And so it really saves me a lot of time right now. Cause like I said, I'm, I'm very busy um, at my job as far as like training people and stuff. So ideally I would like to do the high low, um, but right now it's just a little bit easier for me and a bit more efficient to, to structure my template. And in my story on Instagram a few days ago, I actually wrote out the template and stuff. So I want to get back to lifting a little bit. Um, now you followed some of the Bulgarian teachings. Give us the nuts and bolts of that philosophy and how you applied it to you. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I did the whole squatting every day for about three years back when I owned my own CrossFit powerlifting gym back in Pennsylvania. And so I always like to tell people, though, there is a difference between squatting every day and the Bulgarian system. You can squat every day and not do anything that's even close to the quote unquote Bulgarian stuff. To me, the way I interpreted it um, from the people that I, you know, talked to about it and, you know, read about it from, to me, the Bulgarian system is there, it's three weeks of incredibly heavy loading and a one week unloading. And during those three weeks of loading, there is no light days. Like you are literally working up to a PR attempt every session. Um, and, you know, every session is treated like a competition. And so that's why if you're going to do like the true Bulgarian stuff, you have to have the micro plates because you're not going to be able to just add, you know, five to 10 pounds every session. You know, there were times where I would literally be adding like 0.25, a quarter on each side, you know, so it was a half a pound PR, but it was more weight than the last session. And that's ultimately um, the true Bulgarian system is like, you're literally working up to a hundred percent. And if you ever watched the Iron Mind training hall tape, um, Unbelievable Bulgarians, I believe is the name of it the amount of misses they had in training is unbelievable because again, they're working at that 100% plus level, you know? And so with powerlifting, it's a little bit different because it's more static strength, obviously. So you can't have that many misses. Um, but to keep the overall theme and philosophy of the Bulgarian system intact, um, it's literally PR attempts every session, unless it's an unloading week. I was explaining to a, to a fraternity brother of mine um, because China, I believe they follow a similar system, uh, of the Bulgarians and for people that participate in that type of system, uh, it's kind of a meat grinder, uh, of a system. A hundred percent. And, you know, the candle that burns the brightest burns the fastest. And so I believe I read where the careers of the Bulgarian weightlifters were very short you know, and, and yeah, you know, and there's a tendency to romanticize that type of training, um, squatting every day, maxing out all the time. And I was certainly one of those people back in the day, right? It sounded very hardcore and cool to say I squatted every day and, you know, like attempting PRs every session. Um, but eventually, yeah, it will beat you down. And you got to understand too, like these were, this was their job in Bulgaria. They had access to massage and nutrition and rest and recovery and drugs, of course, you know, all they did was lift weight, you know, so there are some adjustments that have to be made for your everyday person who obviously has to work 40 hours a week and stuff. But to me, at the end of the day, and the reason why I don't train that way anymore is really, it's just not an efficient way to train, right? I mean, if you can increase your squat by only doing it once or twice a week, that makes a lot more sense to me than doing it four, five, six, seven times a week. You know what I'm saying? No, absolutely. Um, I think that's a big thing. Ever since I I got into powerlifting, again, the romantic the romanticization of uh, high volume, uh, you know, Shiko, uh, the Bulgarian method, uh, you know, using the Chinese method. This we have this we have this love of just super high volume not just in powerlifting but in bodybuilding as well thinking it'll get us mm -hmm. to a spot faster now i'm not saying that you shouldn't engage in high volume training at all but you should definitely look into making things more um efficient like you said yeah 100 percent. and i try to tell i try to tell my clients that and i try to really enforce that with myself like to me, like you don't need to be in the gym longer than 45 to 60 minutes. Um, if you're doing the right exercises and it's sequenced properly and it's loaded properly, um, you don't need to be in there to me any longer than 45 to 60 minutes, you know, after a good solid warm up. Um, to me, if you are, you're probably doing, you're resting too long and or you're talking too much. And so that's what I try to stress with my clients is we work at a pretty quick pace and we work at a very efficient pace. And so I just, again, like you said, I think there's just this tendency to romanticize the incredibly high volume stuff or the incredibly high intensity stuff because it sounds hardcore and it sounds cool on social media to say, hey, I'm doing Shiko or, you know, I'm doing German volume training as a bodybuilder or the Bulgarian stuff. So 
Now, when you're doing, even with, with what you're doing, uh, squatting twice a week right now and using a modified Charlie Francis method, um, I'm pretty sure some recovery modalities are there for you because your training is fast, it's brief, but it's very high intensity and that can wear on your body. What are some of the things that you're doing that normal folks can do in their own training to recover? Yeah, so I mean, I do some type of active mobility work both in the morning and in the evening before I go to bed. It's made a huge difference as far as not waking up as stiff, feeling a lot more mobile. Um, Again, the more mobile we are, the better positions we can get into in training. So therefore, it doesn't tax our body as much. I mean, at least in my experience, that's what I've found as I've been able to increase like my ankle dorsiflexion and things like that. Um, training's been a little easier on me. It's not as taxing because, I'm, again, I'm able to get any more efficient position when I do a vertical jump or when I do a squat now and stuff. Because I have even better ankle mobility right um and then just other things that the most important thing is trying to get quality rest you know i mean last night i was in bed you know it was a friday night and i'm in bed at 9 30 right and so and then the biggest thing too is the nutrition you know and like you know it's that's probably been the biggest thing since i started like this athletic journey is i've been very very strict with my nutrition um i would say bodybuilder like honestly because i've had so many people actually when they see me and they seem like my physique and stuff, think I'm actually prepping for a bodybuilding show because of how lean I am. Um, but really the reality is, is there's a good quote and it says fat don't fly. And so if you want to maximize your athletic potential, whether it's, you know, throwing a medicine ball really far or jumping very high or sprinting very fast, it does us no good to carry extra fluff. And so those are the things I would say is rest, nutrition and active mobility work. Now, it's funny that you said that um, Dave Tate also said you can't flex fat, um, meaning that you need muscle to be explosive, you need it to be fast, and you need it to have uh, maximum power output. But you've gone about building your muscle in a, in a very different type of way through uh, using different methods other than uh, wholly traditional bodybuilding. Uh, is there any point that you use traditional uh, hypertrophy methods to actually put on some size or is all of your training strictly or is your body strictly a byproduct of the training that you put yourself through? Yeah, so like I said, very early in my training career when I was, you know, in school, it was bodybuilding stuff. But truly, honestly, since then, and even like when I did the Bulgarian stuff, it was three exercise maximum, squat, bench, band, pull aparts. And so, and right now my current training, like I literally only lift weights twice a week. And so it's most of, I would say not most, but pretty much all of my physique right now is through just performance. And there was a great quote I saw from PJF Performance, who is a top NBA trainer, works with some NFL guys. And he said, uh, chase performance goals or gains and allow the physique to take care of itself. And that's kind of been my experience, not only with myself, but you see other people, you know, when you're training for performance and you're training for athleticism, I've never really seen anyone not have at least a decent physique, right? It kind of tends to, again, take care of itself, as the quote says. So, again, my current physique right now is 100% a byproduct of just training for performance, jumping, athleticism. Now... I know, I know bodybuilding isn't your specialty, um, but I believe you have some value to give to the listeners. From what you see, if, if you follow anybody, where are bodybuilders going wrong in their training and how can they correct it? Sure. I, I would say just in my experience and the few bodybuilders that I follow and, and that I know personally, I would say, I think the biggest thing for some bodybuilders is I think they would be able to better maximize like their leg development if they focused on true, like full range of motion, ATG squats, um, you know, high bar all the way down, you know, take off the knee wraps, take off the belt. You won't be able to use as much weight, but go through that full range of motion uh, to really stimulate the muscle. Same thing when it comes to like doing lunges and that sort of thing is more full range work. Um, and then as far as like the other stuff goes, again, I would say, 
I think some of it tends to be they just do too much work per session, right? Too many, too many sets per muscle group. And so you can't really recover and, and maximize, you know, your training sessions. And even if you are enhanced and you're taking drugs, it becomes a point where it's just too much to recover from, even, again, even if you're enhanced. So, again, just in my experience with the few bodybuilders that I know and that I follow, I, I think they tend to push it a bit too hard, actually, in the gym. I think bodybuilding kind of has that mentality, you know, it comes from maybe like pumping iron and that sort of thing, where it just falls to the wall. I remember watching like Branch Warren training videos, and I'm like, that's insane. He's going to beat his body down training that that aggressive and that hard for. So I think just trying to be more efficient and not going so balls to the wall. And then again, this is just, I'm not speaking for the entire bodybuilding community, but the ones that I follow and, and, and personally speak to, it's like, I don't think like, you know, partial range squats with knee wraps are the way to go. Right? If you're trying to truly maximize your leg development. So. In your, I know you don't train with weights very much, um, but do you follow any type of system uh, to gauge effort, or is it just strictly based off of weight, 90% intensity, 85% or 95% weight, 85% weight max out, or do you follow more of a reps and reserve rate of perceived exertion type model when you're doing your actual weight training? Yeah, so I tend to typically, I either go um, by feel, you know, work up to a top single, um, and then go from there, or it's percentage-based work, like if I'm in a, like a maintenance strength phase for like the squat or the bench press you know maybe work up to like a single at 90 percent and then drop down and do three doubles at 80 percent because again i'm not really trying to push like right now as i'm getting ready for the the, the dunk camp you know the, the the weight work is more in a maintenance phase i'm not going to test the true maximum and really push a bunch of high intensity volume on the, on the strength movements because um, again i'm trying to focus and, and make sure that i peak the explosiveness and the jumping ability so that I'm more in a maintenance phase. And so when I'm in a maintenance phase, I'm working off of percentages. I like to always touch at least something around 90% because I find that um, that allows me again to maintain that strength year round. I don't like to get away from 90% too much. I don't really like the submaximal stuff a whole lot. Um, at least in my experience, whenever I do any sort of dedicated submaximal work, it always feels so much heavier when I try to go back to do it the heavier stuff so like I said right now I'm in a maintenance phase about a 90% single every session and then drop down and hit like maybe two or three doubles at 80 or 85 percent so so let's just say you finish up this uh <clears throat> excuse me let's just say you finish up this phase you have a successful uh time at the dunk camp do you go back to uh Train, weight training a little more often or do you continue the athleticism try to put on a little bit more mass or do you just keep everything uh the same for right now so the plan after the dunk camp the plan i have tentatively in place is to change up the template and uh, do a little bit more weight training the med ball throws and the jumps will enter more of a, a maintenance phase um I'm walking around right now at about 195, 197 pounds. Everyone always thinks that I'm like 230 pounds. I'm not. <laughs> um, I'm under 200 right now. So I would like to, again, after the dunk camp, put on a little bit of size. And, uh, you know, there is definitely a part of me that would still like to pursue that 800-pound squat. Again, that doesn't mean I have any intentions of, of returning to powerlifting or anything like that. I don't know. Um, but that's something that I would like to pursue in the fall and stuff is, you know, adding a little bit more size. And so my split will be uh, three lower body days on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and two upper body days on Tuesday and Thursday. And that's the basic standard ATG knees over toes guy um, template. And I really like that template a lot because you get, you know, five good weight training sessions. It's funny. I just followed them on, uh, <clears throat> I followed them on Instagram, um, literally just now perusing your, uh, perusing your profile. Uh, now you show, you said you're 195 pounds, you're, you're in phenomenal condition. I mean, and I know it's not, I know it's not your deal, but I, I, I have to ask everyone that sports a phenomenal physique. What has stopped you from pulling the trigger on competing in a bodybuilding show? Yeah, like I said, I've, I've gotten the bodybuilding question um, a lot. And I guess I would say the biggest reason why I, I haven't pulled the trigger on a bodybuilding show is 
I just, I just, I have all the respect in the world for bodybuilding. And again, my mom was into like physique and stuff. Like I said, she wrote up my first program. And, uh, you know, my early influences in training were all bodybuilding. I used to take like flex magazines to school and stuff. And so, um, but as I've gotten older, I just, I don't really enjoy that kind of training. Um, the, 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 the more higher volume, the lower intensity, um, it tends to not hold my interest very well. Um, I like to lift heavy. Um, I love to jump around. I like to sprint. I like to throw the med ball. And so that's really not something that you traditionally obviously see in a bodybuilding template. And then another thing for me is like, I like to be in control of the outcome, you know, and that's one thing I will say about powerlifting is it's pretty black and white. You either make the lift or you don't. Um, with bodybuilding, it's so subjective in the sense that you put in all this work in the gym and the nutrition and so strict and the cardio. And at the end of the day, like you're not truly in control of the outcome. It's all in the eyes of the judge. And so it's similar um, to my sister grew up. She was a figure skater. And it's similar in that aspect. You put in all this work, you have this great routine and you think it's awesome, but yet maybe the judges don't like it. And so, um, you know, that's probably another reason why I don't think I would ever go down the bodybuilding route is I don't think I would be motivated enough to train that way for long enough. And that's fair. Um, you know, I, I, for some reason, and we'll just chalk it up to youth, um, <clears throat> back in the day, we're talking like late 90s, 2000s, uh, I would get offended by uh, people who didn't want to participate in bodybuilding, but now being 41, 42 in August, it's uh, like, well, you know what? It's really not for everybody. Um, either the training isn't, the nutrition isn't, the entire lifestyle isn't, um, the periphery of the industry isn't for a lot of people. Um, so no, I totally get that. And I totally respect that. Um, but yeah, and go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, and like I said, I have just tremendous respect for, like I said, I, you know, the bodybuilders I follow and the, and the few that I know, like the, the discipline and the dedication that it takes. And, and like I said, for me, the nutrition wouldn't be the issue. Cause like I said, my nutrition is very strict right now. It's just, like I said, I just, I don't enjoy that kind of training enough to where I'd want to dedicate myself throughout a whole, say 12, 16, 20 week prep. I just, it, it wouldn't hold my interest. Now, who are you, you mentioned, uh, some bodybuilders that uh you follow who are you following right now so let's see here i follow um is it uh hunter labrada i believe is hunter labrada yeah yeah he's one of my favorites Rock. right now yeah he's an absolute beast i follow him and then i follow um oh what's his name he used to be an animal athlete i don't think he's with animal anymore he's a 212 is it Derek lunsford yeah, Derek. Yeah, he's with Eva Jen now. Yeah, yeah. No, he's a phenomenal. So those are the two that I that I really follow, and they have just, I mean, they're absolutely jacked out of their mind, and they so, carry so much muscle mass. So I enjoy following um, those two. Of course, I follow you, obviously, and stuff. So um, yeah, those are the those are the three that I follow. Um, off the top of my head, I'd have to go to like my Instagram and stuff to see the others. But those are the, you and and Derek and Hunter are the three that jump out at me that I follow. Hunter's actually competing today. Um, Is he really? Yeah, so long story short, with COVID, uh, Illinois has quote unquote opened back up, but the Chicago Pro is in Atlanta uh, today. So he's competing in that show. And that show is, that is probably going to be the third best show on the calendar this year because no it's one of the few shows that's full-on bodybuilding that guys can use that haven't qualified for the olympia so you've got hunter you've got roly winkler you've got several top 10 top guys doing that show and i saw the 212s last night and let me tell you some people are going home unhappy and they're gonna have to go to the next show which is the tampa and then uh, I think the Arnold in September is a qualifier for this year's Olympia. So that lineup okay. was stacked. Now, you brought up an interesting guy, and I wanted to ask you when it comes to bodybuilding, because um, I, I don't follow him, but I, I've seen his stuff. Do you think Raleigh Winkler will ever put it together and, and win the Olympia? 
It's a, it's a, that's a funny question, man. Cause I, I literally had this conversation last night when it comes to, when it comes to him, he's a unique case because he has all the tools to be Mr. Olympia with the exception of one thing, which is condition. And he always misses the mark in my opinion, like mm -hmm. somebody was saying, well, a truly uh, zippered up Roly Winkler will win the Olympia. Well, we've never seen a truly zippered up Roly Winkler. And the time that he was close to that, you know, he placed in the top five at the Olympia, but he didn't win. Um, but I, I don't never want to say never, because I also said I never thought that Big Rami would win the Olympia. Big Rami is not a physique that I personally would like or aspire to, but I get why he won. I think he could do it. I thought too. You know. I didn't expect him to win it. I that's that was surprising to me. That that was one. But. The the sheer size of him, and this is this is my gripe with bodybuilding, and it's always been my gripe. You have to stop being so impressed with sheer size that yes. everything yes. else comes at uh everything else comes at a second. Um, now I'm not saying people. Uh, the size of two 12 guys should ever beat a big Rami like on any planet that should never happen even if they are well put together like you he can eat the 212 competitor but you, you gotta stop pushing uh and I sound like Sean Ray and I hate that so much uh you gotta stop pushing size but that's been my gripe with bodybuilding for years so now big Rami mm -hmm. has won the Olympia and I'm a big fan of like team bodybuilding, right? Because I came in as a team right. competitor. What message do you send to those guys? Right, right. You know, but I, I long story short, yes, I think Roley can win, but that that's that's got to come like from him. And you know, people thought Brandon Curry couldn't win, and Brandon right. Curry won. That's 100 percent right. No, it's uh. It's interesting, like I said, because he certainly carries a ton of size. Raleigh does. Um, but yeah, yeah, you know, like you, I, I, conditioning's always kind of been lackluster relative to the other competitors, which has kind of held him back. Now, what I what I will say is, I, I'm not. I don't think he's doing the Arnold, um, but, and this is this is a big but. I think Hunter can catch him sleeping today if he's not a hundred percent. Um, be because, awesome. because with a lot of these guys, uh, and I've worked with, I've worked in the industry before in two magazines, flex and muscular development. A lot of these guys will do a show. They will come in at what they call 90%, 85% because they think they can pick up a W. And then you got that hungry wolf, Hunter Labrada, you know, guys like Ian Valier, they come in, they take your lunch money and then you're all mad because you got to do another fucking show. Um, right. so I, I, I think if Roly is a smidge off, Hunter can take him. That would be cool. That'd be cool. I like Hunter a lot. I, I like Hunter a lot too. I, I think he can do it. Um, so let's get back to, uh, training a bit. Do you train any athletes right now? Um, let's see here. Look at my clients I train with. Currently, I don't have any like actual athletes per se i mean i have some power lifters uh, that i train um as far as like football players track athletes uh that sort of thing off the top of my head i can't think of any that i train in person that are that are going for just pure athleticism right now i don't so is that something that you've ever aspired to do training like uh nfl stars nba people um, amazing that I, I would love to do that you know but I also you know for me I enjoy training a wide variety of 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 clients so like I have you know people with varying fitness levels and competitive power lifters and that sort of thing so it does you know variety is a spice of life they say and so it's kind of nice to have like you know different people every session as far as like what their goals are where they're at in their in their fitness journey and that sort of thing but yeah I would love to have the opportunity to like really work with like an NFL player or an NBA player and I just think that would be uh, absolutely amazing to be handed the, the keys to their training program and uh, try to take them to another level for sure. 
I know we have this little thing on Instagram called the explore tab. And I'm, I'm sure like me, yours is filled with a lot of uh, collegiate strength training clips or, you know, athletes doing collegiate strength training programs or things of that nature. Uh, this is another where things are going wrong question. Where do you think training the college athlete and the high school athlete goes south? What are coaches not yeah. doing or realizing to make these guys better? I would say the biggest mistake, especially when it comes to football, is the conditioning, whether it's doing crossfit style conditioning, high intensity interval training, um, having them do long, slow distance running. That does nothing to prepare someone. Uh, for football. Football is five to six seconds of maximum effort with about 30 to 35 second break. So doing gassers and 100 meter sprints or running two miles or doing a 21-15-9 CrossFit wad has absolutely no carryover to the conditioning demands of football. So I would say that's the biggest thing um, as far as football and just sports in general too. Like there's this, you know, run the athletes into the ground, make them puke, you know, that sort of thing, like that whole army military mentality, like it needs to go away when it comes to training an athlete, because you're doing more damage than you are good whenever you, um, you know, do that type of training and stuff. And again, the number one thing that should be your priority, whether you're training a high school athlete, and certainly if you're training a professional athlete who's making millions of dollars, is injury prevention, right? You can never truly prevent an injury but that should be the number one goal is, is, is to try to keep them as healthy as possible, right? And then from there, everything else gets layered underneath that. Um, but the biggest thing you see is just the conditioning. It doesn't make sense. And of course, the overuse of the Olympic lifts. And again, football players are freaky athletes. They're very strong, but you watch the form on these power clean videos and it is just, it just makes you cringe because you worry for the athlete, right? There are so many other ways you can get stronger. And I posted a graph last week on my Instagram story about the overall motor units involved in explosive medicine ball throws. And there are literally as many motor units involved in explosive medicine ball work as there are the Olympic lifts. And to me, there are just more efficient and easier ways to get athletes explosive than having them do the Olympic lifts because it takes so long to teach the movements. They're far more technical than the static strength powerlifting movements. You know, and so I just, I think it's a waste of time um, with our athletes to have them do the Olympic lifts when there are other things we can do that are much easier uh, to promote explosive power development. And that's another thing, like a lot, I see a lot of uh, strength coaches do the Olympic lifts and is absolutely, it, it makes no sense, right? Because you're training a totally different, you're wanting someone to train a totally different sport to get better at their chosen sport, better and stronger at their chosen sport, which right. makes absolutely no sense to me. No sense. Right. And, you know, here's the thing, too, with the Olympic lifts. They have, like, everyone thinks, oh, they're, they're, they're this amazing tool to develop power, right? They're really not, because at the end of the day, there's a deceleration phase that takes place. No matter what anyone tries to tell you, you have to decelerate the bar. So that's going to limit the amount of power development you can have. Otherwise, the bar would literally come out of your hands. It's the same thing with the West Side Barbell Dynamic Effort stuff. You know, they promote about you know the bands and the chains. Even with the accommodating resistance, you still have to decelerate the bar. Otherwise, it's going to come out of your hands. And that's why explosive medicine ball works is, in my opinion, superior to the Olympic list for power development, because one, the barrier of entry is significantly less. You know, you can teach someone to do a backwards overhead medicine ball throw or a squat throw for height in maybe, you know, 60 seconds to 90 seconds, right? It doesn't take very long. You're not teaching anybody to do the Olympic list in 90 seconds. But the biggest reason why it's superior to the Olympic list for power development is because you actually release the object, right? It's true ballistic training. So like it's, you release the object. In Olympic lifting, you're not releasing the object. Again, you have to have a deceleration phase so you limit the amount of power development. Whereas with the medicine ball, again, you're truly not decelerating at all. You're actually ballistically releasing the object. And that's how you develop true power. Do you think power lifters can benefit from medicine ball throws? I think everybody can. You know, here's the thing. 
you know, if you had asked me this question 10 years ago, I'd have a different answer. Um, but in my opinion, if I could only use two training modalities to train people, it would be medicine balls and the sled. And you could create strong and explosive, well-developed athletes just by having them drag the sled and do medicine ball work. Um, I, I, I am a huge, as if anyone who follows me on Instagram knows, I'm a huge, huge fan of medicine ball work, not only with the explosive throws, but again, the core work and the extensive med ball throws, which are low intensity throws done on tempo days for higher volume, upper body conditioning and stuff. But I think powerlifters absolutely can benefit. Again, if you're looking to, to me, you would get far more benefit doing an explosive chest pass where you're actually releasing the ball and throwing it against the wall, as opposed to doing the West side barbell speed bench against the band. That's not really doing anything. That's very interesting. And I definitely wanted your opinion on that. Um, because a lot of, a lot of guys do the West side barbell method. Um, but I've never thought of traditional power lifting being a being powerful, right? Like, yes, you have to put maximum force in a bar to basically get the bar off your chest if you're in a bench press position. But that's a lot of uh, isometric holding if you get stuck. Uh, you know, that's a lot of your body working synergistically and the explosiveness off the chest it makes more sense when you explain using a med ball to a wall versus doing a speed bench because of the deceleration. Right, right. And, you know, here's the thing too, like at the end of the day, explosive strength, no matter what West Side says, does not matter in powerlifting. The only thing that matters is maximal limit strength. Like you don't even have to have speed days um, to be a very successful powerlifter. And to be honest with you, I don't know any of the top raw power lifters that that strictly follow like a conjugate or a west side style um template like i can't think of any that i see that do like traditional speed work so again the value of speed work and power lifting i think it's kind of always been debated and i've always been on the side of um it's just it's not necessary to increase your one rm in the big three it's just really not Let's move to nutrition a little bit. Um, again, you sport a very, very impressive physique. Um, now, what is your nutrition like these days? Yes, yeah, so it's very intuitive. Um, I'm not super strict as far as tracking. The one thing I do track is the protein. You know, so I have about 200 grams of protein per day, and then based upon what is on the training menu. I will cycle my fat and carbs. So on like explosive med ball and jump days, and like today is a weight training day, um, my carbohydrates will be higher and my fats will be lower. On a day where I'm doing tempo work or, or backwards running, um, my carbohydrates will drop a little bit and I'll increase the healthy fats. Uh, and same thing on like an off day. It's, uh, the carbs are lower, the protein's consistent, and the healthy fats are um, raised a bit. So basically it's, 200 grams of protein consistently every day. And then I'm just cycling the fats and carbs based upon what I got on the training schedule that day. And so it's, again, it's nothing groundbreaking or anything like that, but I found it to be um, very effective for me. And what I've really found too, is just, if you track your protein, everything else kind of tends to fall into place. I don't know if you've, you know, found something similar as far as, you know, bodybuilding goes, but that's what I've really found is like, um, I can kind of get away with not tracking the, the, the carbs and fats so much as long as I'm consistently tracking that protein. Everything else tends to kind of fall in place, at least for me. I have, uh, now I'm not, the, I'm not the best when it comes to nutrition. Um, yesterday I posted something on Instagram that food is a trigger for me, mainly because I like it because it tastes good. Um, so me, <laughs> me disregarding donuts at my job yesterday was a win for me. Um, I know a lot of P I know I'm not a hardcore bodybuilder because I admit weakness around food, but I, that's the way our society, our food system has been set up with junk food and all that we're supposed to succumb mm -hmm. to it to drive profit, but that's a whole other conspiracy theory that I have. Um, but yes, protein is key. You get the protein in, you follow it up with some type of carplex carbohydrate, and then you follow that up. Uh, with a little bit of fat, depending upon the day. Um, and obviously, once we get into competitive stuff, pre-contest period, it gets a little bit more nuanced. But the hardest sure. thing for people to get down 
are those ounces of protein because it's just so involved. When you think about mm -hmm. digesting protein, right? You actually have to be invested and involved with your food. So like you really, for you to like truly digest it, truly break it down in your body, you have to chew it, right? And the sure. harder you have to work when you chew a food, um, you know, the more you have to, the more you have to chew it and any type of food that makes you work to digest it is a food that belongs in your body. Because if you look at a McDonald's cheeseburger, as soon as you put it in your mouth, it damn near basically dissolves, right? Right, exactly. So yep. getting that protein down, getting those carbs down, getting those foods that you actually have to work for and chew, um, no matter how well you cook it, is key to physique goals, body goals, athletic goals, whatever have you. I like a good cheeseburger as much as the next person. I even succumb to McDonald's sometimes, but always keep in mind that if this is for anybody that's listening, that's struggling with food, the more you have to chew your food, the leaner and the leaner it is, the more it will help you in your physique and athletic development. So don't get into it's just a cheeseburger because that's just going to compound. And believe me, I know because I'm a fat boy at heart is just going to compound <laughs> into you eating more of that food. So. No, I mean, that, that, make, that makes a ton of sense. And, and, and like I said, for me, it's, it's just really nailing down the protein and, and everything just kind of falls into place after that. But I completely agree with you. You put a McDonald's quote cheeseburger in your mouth and it, basically you don't have to chew it it kind of just dissolves so to speak yeah i mean they don't have food scientists for huge uh mega chain restaurants for nothing no no and it's 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 funny like like i said i like a good cheeseburger from time to time but i'll go to these smaller joints where i actually have to work to eat the food right um and they're they're out there they're out there i mean it's still crap food but you know, you still have to work, you're at least getting some nutritional value out of it. Exactly, exactly. Now, I want to get into uh, training a 500 pound bench press, right? Um, we yeah. have a mutual friend, uh, Matt Ulrich. So for those that don't know Matt, uh, he's from the Chicagoland area, big surprise with me, right? But he was also a <laughs> Northwestern graduate. And uh, he won a Super Bowl with the Indianapolis Colts at the expense of my Chicago Bears. Um, <laughs> um, Matt actually uh, trained at Quads Gym for, for a brief period, and we became pretty friendly, and we've kept up with each other on Facebook. Uh, he moved to Montana because that's where his wife is from, and they now have a, a family with three boys, I believe. And, you know, he's still trying to rock it out, prevent dad bod and stay uh, nice and strong. But he recently got a 500 pound bench press, which essentially is in powerlifting circles, elite, right? An elite bench press before the age sure. of 40. Uh, explain how that whole process went and what people can do to increase their bench if they're a broken up old man. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, first of all, I, you know, I, I started working with Matt. I got out to, to the Ozman here in March and kind of started working with him um, there at the time. He kind of had already a program that they had him doing at Prime and stuff. And I would say the biggest thing is, you know, Billy McLennan, who's the owner of Prime, really worked with Matt on his form. So, like, I didn't have to, like, take the time to, you know, teach him the technique and stuff, right? Matt's form was dialed in and, and, and everything. So, uh, Billy's just a great, great guy, a phenomenal, phenomenal person. Um, so the, the technique was already there. And then, so me for basically like, we kind of talked about like West Side Barbell earlier. I'm not a fan of like the speed work, but I do think the max effort stuff um, tends to translate very well over to the bench press. And so the, the training template that we put together for him to hit the 500 pound bench press was, uh, it was a two week, it was a six week cycle. And uh, we did two weeks. The first two weeks were a, a two board press. Uh, the next two weeks were a full range of motion against doubled bands. And then we did two weeks of a one board. And then seventh week, um, we tested the one RM and he hit the 505 uh, in the gym. 
And so, in my opinion, I think that the the, the, the conjugate stuff, the max effort stuff, is is actually really good for the bench press. Mm-hmm. Not really a big fan of it uh, for the squat and the deadlift, but I think it has a lot of value um, for bench pressing. And then we had like a secondary bench day uh, where we would do like um, seated overhead press, and we would push it push it pretty heavy. And then once we got closer to you know getting ready to test the 505, um, we dropped the intensity on the, the secondary bench day and the overhead press, and uh, just did a little bit lighter volume and stuff to kind of peak them uh, to test that. Uh, 505, but I don't like to take um, much, if any, credit uh, for the 505. Like I said, Matt's been working his butt off his whole life. He's a great athlete, Super Bowl champion. Uh, he's a better person. Um, we've developed a friendship, too. It's been awesome to work with him. And, of course, like I said, Billy did a great job, um, you know, dialing in his technique. So, um, you know, I don't like to take uh, any credit for people's success, but uh, that's kind of what I laid out for him. And uh, just really happy to see him hit the, the 505. Have you ever thought about putting out your own type of training manual for people? Yeah, I've, I've gotten a lot of people that have messaged me about it, whether it's, you know, I've had people lately asking about, you know, a vertical jump manual, medicine ball work. Um, and of course, in the past, a lot of like squat manuals and that sort of thing. I've debated it and I've thought about it. Um, and it's probably something that I might do eventually. I'm just, I'll just be honest, like, I'm not really sure how the whole ebook stuff works. So, like, I'd have to, like, talk to somebody who's done it and could help me out as far as, like, putting it together and stuff because I'm just not, you know, privy and savvy to, to how that stuff works. Like, I could write up the training program, but, like, I have no idea how to, like, put it in an ebook format or, or anything like that or how to set up a, a place where they could, like, buy it and stuff like that. I'm just not... <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I just don't know. So that's kind of been one of the bigger reasons why I haven't. But I don't know. I've given out a lot of free information over the years. And uh, I think one thing that, that bugs me a little bit is like, um, you know, people will do one powerlifting meet and then all of a sudden they're an online coach or they're trying to sell a program and stuff like that. And so um, I don't know. Um, sometimes I feel like it would be wrong of me to take money from people after I've pretty much given out a lot of free information about jumping medicine ball work and then squat work so there's probably enough free squat programs out there that i posted that it just morally probably wouldn't sit right for me even if i charged a low number of like 5.99 for the program so never say never um, but right now probably not now here's another question and this is a this is a very unique question because you're not uh you're one of very few guys that had this opportunity um you're a huge professional wrestling fan and you knock something off of your bucket list, uh, which yeah. I just, I just found like, I totally fangirled when this happened. You had a tryout for, of all places, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Tell us about that, please. Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't technically say it was a tryout per se, though I did have to like, um, fill out an application and be selected right for their camp and so um, I didn't think I would be selected for the camp to be honest with you and so but you had to like submit your form and they even said you know the thing like you're not guaranteed to be selected and you know different criteria will go into it and stuff and so um, at the time you know all I had to rely on was my big squat videos and stuff and so I you know, submitted my form, told them I was a huge fan of pro wrestling, I've you know, watched all my life, and New Japan was my favorite promotion, and I'll never forget going home from the gym the one night and uh, getting the email notification from New Japan that I had been selected to attend uh, the camp in uh, 2018, and what was really cool was, like, I was the only one there that had no prior um, actual professional wrestling experience. Like, everyone that I worked with has been, had been in the business and were wrestlers, and I think the most veteran guy there had been in the business for like 10 or 12 years. So it was a really cool honor for me to um, get selected to come participate. Like I said, especially with no background at all, other than just being a fan. And it's kind of funny that you, you bring up the new Japan. Cause like, you know, with the training that I'm doing now and the shape that I'm in, like I often think to myself, you know, what would it be like now to go to that camp, you know, just being so much more athletic and, you know, in, in better shape, but it was, uh, the time of a life, the experience of a lifetime, and I tell people it was the hardest three days of my life. We did more Hindu squats 
in push-ups than I'll ever do the rest of my life. It was uh, very intense, very hardcore, um, but it was an unbelievable experience. And, and like you said, it was uh, something that I got to check off my bucket list. So it was, uh, I can always say that I was in an official New Japan pro wrestling ring. So was that experience with New Japan, has that, did that translate and help you transition your training saying, hey, I see a weakness in my own training that I need to address? Yeah, yeah. And so like to get ready for the New Japan camp, like I did a lot of like, um, like hit style training, you know, the burpees, the CrossFit stuff. And so I was really good at that. But um, at the camp, it really wasn't about that. It was more muscular endurance stuff. So like we would literally start each day with, goodness, like 500 Hindu squats and 300 Hindu push-ups. So that's a different kind of endurance that I didn't do in my training. You know, I was doing the more ballistic, the burpees, the jumping, you know, the 21, 15, 9, trying to get done in, you know, three or four minutes, right? And you go to camp and it's more like strength and muscular endurance. And it was just an entirely different level of conditioning. And I was not prepared for that. And so that really, um, to me identified that yeah my muscular and, and strength endurance was just absolutely atrocious you know i had great anaerobic endurance you know um, i could do a crossfit wad um but if you asked me to do like 300 hindu push-ups or 500 hindu squats like i just didn't have the endurance to do it and so like the warm-up every day at the camp was just brutal it truly felt like a full-on <laughs> workout for me and then like we were just getting started you know it was like a half hour warm-up and then we had another two and a half hours of con other conditioning work and entering work. And I'm like, Oh my goodness, you know? So that was a real eye opener to me as far as like that sort of like fast paced, you know, CrossFit style stuff doesn't really translate over to the, the slower, more methodical muscular endurance, ultra high rep stuff. Just like if all you did was like muscular endurance stuff, Hindu pushups, Hindu squats, uh, and then all of a sudden you had to do burpees again you're not preparing your body for it so like it would just crush you right away and so that was probably my biggest takeaway um, from the new japan camp is i didn't probably i didn't well, I shouldn't say probably i didn't train conditioning truly the way that i should have for that specific camp do you um do online training at this point I have a thing in my Instagram bio, um, you know, if, if people message me, it's, it's one of those things where now I'm so busy at Prime as far as working with people in person that um, I've, I've dropped a lot of the online stuff just because if I can't give a service that is, you know, up to my standards, um, it, it's not right and it's just morally wrong. And so um, I've had a few people message me and I'll, I'll do it on a case by case basis, but I truly won't take more than like three to five people at a time because I just got so much going on at prime. And then with my own training that if I did any more than that, I wouldn't be able to truly um, give them the value of the service. And that's just, that's wrong. Right. And so I, I just can't, um, I just can't do it, but it's, it's one of those things where it's a case by case basis. Now I want to get into some more uh, personal stuff. What drives you every day? What 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 motivates you to get up out of bed um, and just get to work and crush on your goals? Yeah, um, I would say for me, I've always been I've always been motivated. But you know, motivation is fleeting, right? It takes discipline. There are days where we don't want to train. Um, but you know, a spark was really that for me when my dad passed away. Um, last year, May 27th, 2020. And, um, you know, and that's kind of been like my motivation with, with training here is like, you know, I just want to do everything I can to, to make him proud. It's, it's a dunk camp and just in general. And, and I don't know if, you know, if I could talk to him right now, he'd be, he'd be quite happy with the way things are going out here in, in Montana and certainly with my training and stuff. But I would say my biggest motivator right now is just, you know, um, uh, making my dad proud and uh you know that's that's what really drives me every day to train uh condolences on your dad i definitely know how it feels to be in that boat um 2020 was tough for a lot of people but to lose a parent that's that's a different type of hurt yeah and that was uh yeah just uh just 
I've, uh, you know, I've never felt that sort of uh, pain and hurt in my life before, for sure. Now, do you have any, like, recommendations for self-improvement books, self-help books, motivational books, what have you? Um, you know, I, I, I really don't. Um, I would say, I, just, I always tell people this, and I tell the clients that I work with, like, you know, motivation will get you started. You'll come with the goal and the ambition, and and you're always fired up to start. Um, but discipline is what's going to keep you coming through the doors. And as long as you show up, you'll do the work, you know. So just having that discipline to walk through the doors, because once you're there, um, you'll do the work. But sometimes, you know, you got to talk yourself out of driving home after work. You know, you got to go to the gym, get the, get the workout in. Uh, but you'll feel a lot better about yourself if you do it. And so, um, again, I would say more, it's not so much motivation. It's just trying to have that self-discipline and, and understanding and trying to have a long-term vision. You know, and I always tell my clients this too, is, you know, have both short-term and long-term goals. Um, and because that keeps it, you know, that can keep it motivating for you, right? And so um, if all you have is a long-term goal and you come to me and you say, well, I want to bench press 500 and right now you're only at 350, well, that's probably going to be a long ways away. So let's also have a short-term goal in mind, you know? And so it's, it's more motivating to come because, 350 to 500 can seem a long way to back. So um, have both short-term and long-term goals, but understand that it's going to take self-discipline more than motivation uh, to achieve what you want to. What's the one thing that people can take away from this podcast about you? I would just say that, you know, um, certainly there's nothing special about me as far as genetics or anything like that. I would say um, consistency wins again it's having that self-discipline to show up and put in the work and if you do that consistently day after day month after month year after year um, you'll certainly reach your goals so again I, I like the, the short and simple quote and it's consistency wins and so that's the biggest thing I would say if, if people are listening to this podcast is uh, just be consistent in your training your nutrition and your rest and recovery and uh, you know you can achieve whatever you want to achieve in your fitness in your fitness goals all right. Well, thank you for joining us this morning, Damien. I really appreciate it. Uh, this is uh, this is the interview that I really, really wanted because just your training is, uh, even though I don't train in that manner, is captivating me because we've followed each other for a long time. So thank you for joining us and giving us a dive into uh, who you are as a person, what your beliefs are as far as your training, and uh, how can people get in contact with you if they want to reach out for you, reach out to you rather. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, you know, if, if you're interested in like the online stuff, I'll do it on a case by case basis. Like I said, I don't want to take too many because I'm so busy at Prime, but you can certainly send me an email or a, a direct message on Instagram. Um, and then also, if you're local to the Montana area, you know, you can certainly sign up at Prime uh, to work with me one on one. It's uh, the best gym in Montana for sure, Prime Performance and Physio. So again, you can. Um, come join our gym and, and work with me one-on-one -on -one in person so okay outstanding so take that trip to montana guys it'll probably be well worth the money uh thank you again for joining us uh i really really appreciate it and uh we will see you on the instagram and on the twitter all right thank you so much sir take care now take care for vaughn and teen uh damien I'm Larry Brown, and we will see you next time. Thanks for listening, guys. You can subscribe on iTunes. I'm still trying to get Spotify worked out here. Uh, my feed has been blocked by RSS, so I have to straighten that out. But definitely listen to us on iTunes and listen to us on YouTube. All right? Thanks a lot, guys. You have a great day.